Thank you. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packer and welcome to Threshold of Hope, our program, <coughs> our program where we bring you the writings of the church. Before we get to our new document, I want to mention that today is the Feast of St. John Bosco. He was born in 1815, a very poor family, and he had to go take care of the sheep. While he was taking care of the sheep, he taught himself how to juggle. There's not a lot to do with taking care of sheep, so he might as well learn to do something. And he would entertain his friends with juggling and all. And yet he wanted to do more. He wanted to go to school and become a priest. The local parish priest helped him with this. And he got an education and became a priest. But he saw a tremendous problem in, as the uh, Industrial Revolution was affecting Italy that there were many boys living on the streets. And so he developed a ministry to help those homeless kids and started homes and schools for them. One of the ways that he attracted their attention because they were already very worldly, you know, being living on the streets uh, by their own wits. So he would use juggling to attract them. And you, while he juggled, he would tell them the catechism and eventually got them to go to schools homes, take care of them, and became both a spiritual and uh, sort of an economic father to them. He died in 1888 after a good long life and was canonized in 1934 by Pope Pius XI. All right. Well, we are ready to begin a new document. We finished up Ver uh, Verbum Dei. Dei Verbum, um, the document from Vatican II. Now we'd like to deal with a document by Pope Benedict. This is our first document by Pope Den Benedict that we're doing in this program. And it's called Verbum Domini, Word of the Lord. So the other one we, we, from Vatican II is Dei Verbum, Word of God. He is obviously picking up on the Vatican II document. And this document that we're reading, Verbum Domini, is available in two ways. One, you can go to EWTN Religious Catalog and order it there at 1-800-854-6316 or go to the website www.ewtnreligiouscatalog.com and you can buy it there. Or you can go to our website, uh, which is ewtn.com, and go to our document library under the Faith tab of the website and search for the keyword do Verbum Domini. And also at the website, you can watch last week's Threshold of Hope if you missed it by clicking on EWTN Live Shows and then click on Threshold. Now we want to remind you, this is your show and we want to hear from you, our audience. You can do that in three different ways. You can make a trip here to Alabama and be part of our studio audience and ask questions that way and take part in the show. Secondly, you can always email your questions to threshold at EWTN.com. Or thirdly, you can call during our live broadcast. Now the number is 1-800-221 9460. It's 1-800-221-9460. Or you can also call 205-271-2980. And we'll take your questions in the second half of our show. So call right, right around then. Let's begin with uh, Verbum Domini, Word of the Lord. The introduction marks paragraph uh, 1. And in this introduction, it starts off by saying, uh, quoting from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24 to 25. All flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower, flower falls, but the word of the Lord abides forever. Now, that word is the good news which was preached to you. So that's what he's starting off with. 
that the word of the Lord abides forever, and that that word that abides forever is the gospel that preaches to you. And by the way, St. Peter is quoting Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, which also says, the grass withers, the flower, flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. With this assertion from the first letter of St. Peter, which takes up the words of the prophet Isaiah, we find ourselves before the mystery of God. This is one of the very important things about our faith. When we deal with God, we're dealing with a mystery. He is far beyond our minds and therefore is a mystery. And yet, even though he's a mystery, he has made himself known through the gift of his word. This word has entered into time. It is not a mythological word that existed before time exist, existed, but it's a word that exists in history, and God gives us his word in history. Now, God spoke his eternal word humanly. Now, that's a very important line. God spoke his word humanly. He gets that from John chapter 1, verse 14, where it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And we have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. So the word became flesh. In time, Jesus Christ, born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, who had a three-year public ministry, this Jesus Christ, lived within human time. And the fact that God's word became flesh is the good news. That God so loved the world that he sent his only son to become flesh so that we can have, so that those who believe in him may have eternal life. That's from John 3, 16. This is the proclamation that has come down through the centuries to today. Now, there was a synod, and this document is based on the writings of the synod that was held uh, in October 5th to the 26th of 2008. And it took the Pope a while to write this, but he wrote this last year. And the theme of that 12th synod was, and I quote, the word of God in the life and mission of the church. So how the Word of God has a role in the life of the church and the mission of the church. And because this is an exhortation, he's going to want us to begin thinking about how the Word of God has a role in our life and our mission as Catholics. And this, the, the Synod Fathers asked the Pope, to make known to the whole people the, of God all the fruits that came from the synod. So he, wa he went to revisit the work of the synod in light of its doc various documents, because they wrote various documents called Lineamenta, Instrumentum Laboris, Relaciones Ante, et Post Deceptationem. These are different Latin terms for the kinds of documents that they produced at the synod. And there were interventions on the synod floor in a written form. Um, and then a final message to the people of God from the synod. By going back to all these writings, the Pope wishes to point out certain fundamental approaches to a rediscovery of God's word in the life of the church as a wellspring of constant renewal. Now, this is a great point. Listen to that again. I wish to point out, point out certain fundamental approaches to a rediscovery of the Word of God. He wants us all to rediscover Scripture in the life of the church because Scripture is going to be a wellspring for constant renewal. The church needs to be renewed. A lot of times things seem a little stale. And people get bored with church. 
Well, going back to the scripture is one way among many of reinvigorating the life of the church. And that's what we want to do. At this time, he expresses hope that the word will be ever more fully at the heart of every ecclesial activity so that he wants the word of God to be at the heart of every activity of the church and that everything we do will be informed by sacred scripture personally and whatever we do as a church in a group. He wants scripture to be at the center. Paragraph two is entitled, That Our Joy May Be Complete. Before all else, he wants to call to mind the beauty and pleasure of the renewed encounter with the Lord Jesus, which they experienced during the Synod. You know, he really enjoyed the Synod. And there are a number of expressions throughout about how much he enjoyed it. So that in union with the Synod Fathers, they, he uses the words of St. John from his first epistle, 1 John chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, where he's, he cites this as a way to understand the power of the sin and what the sinner was trying to do, where St. John wrote, the life was made manifest, and we saw it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. So that's the quote from 1 John chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Now he highlights some things. St. John the Apostle speaks to us of hearing Jesus, seeing Jesus, touching, and looking upon him. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. So St. John saw and touched and, and heard and the Pope is trying to say that at the Synod, the experience of the Lord was something that was like that. They had a sense that they were listening to the Lord, they were seeing the Lord acting, and that, the, that Christ was very powerfully active in the Synod. Because this very life was made manifest in Jesus Christ. Now, he also says that they were called to communion with God and among ourselves at the Synod. That's one part of what it means to be the church. Pope John Paul II kept on emphasizing that the church is a community because it is in communion, first of all, with God. Secondly, among ourselves. And at the Synod, they experienced that. And therefore, the Pope wants to proclaim that gift, what it was like to be in communion with God and one another at the Synod. From this charismatic standpoint, charismatic uh, comes from the Greek word kerygma, K-E-R-Y-G-M-A, kerygma. And that means announcement, or proclamation, better yet, proclamation. And so from this the standpoint of proclaiming, the synod assembly was a testimony before the church and before the world to the immense beauty of encountering the word of God in the communion of the church. So that's one of the things that these bishops who met at that synod in October 2008 were a testimony by the fact of the way they assembled and the way they prayed together and had a dialogue that it was not a political event 
It was a spiritual event. So they weren't doing all this infighting like politicians sometimes do. For this reason, I encourage all the faithful to renew their personal and communal encounter with Christ, the word of life made visible. That's the first thing he wants. He's asking all of us throughout this whole exhortation. He is exhorting us to renew our own personal and communal encounter with Jesus Christ. We need to, encounter, to know Jesus as individuals in our private prayer life, but also as a community when we get together at church. And secondly, after having this personal and communal encounter with Christ, after getting to know Jesus personally, then we also become his heralds. We start to talk about him because once you come to know Christ, you don't want to keep it bottled up inside. You want to let the power of Christ's good news come out of you. And that's exactly what he's looking for. And the reason is that the gift of divine life, communion, can spread ever more fully throughout the world. He wants everyone in the world to experience communion with God and one another. Indeed, sharing in the life of God, a trinity of love, is complete joy. And this we see in 1 John chapter 1, verse 4, that we are writing this that our joy may be complete. He wants that joy of knowing the Blessed Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is itself a communion of persons. And as Pope John Paul kept on emphasizing, is the model for our communion, the way the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three distinct persons and yet one God. So also, we are to be distinct persons and yet one church. And this is going to be the model for us. That will be our source of joy. And it is the church's gift and inescapable duty to commemorate that joy. Born of an encounter with the person of Christ, the word of God in our midst. So that we have a duty to communicate joy. You know, you look at the world. And do you find much joy? You do hear people going whoop and, you know, making all sorts of hooting sounds. But are they really expressing joy? You know, one of the things I remember walking with a good priest friend who was my spiritual director back in the 80s. And we were walking by a party. And he said, listen for a minute. And I listened. I said, what? He said, notice, at that party, nobody is laughing. People oftentimes do not laugh at parties because they're not having an experience of joy. They'll make a lot of noises, but they won't be laughing. And that's one of the things that we want to have is joy in Christ. Now, the world often feels that God is superfluous or extraneous. That is, God is something extra, that's superfluous, or extraneous. That is, he's so far remote from the world. I saw a movie about uh, th this weekend about some men stuck in northern Alaska and trying to escape wolves. I don't recommend the movie myself a whole lot. Uh, a friend of mine asked me to see it. He heard good reviews, but... I disagreed with the reviewers, but it be that as it may. Uh, I saw the movie, and one of the themes of the movie is that these men are stuck, and they have no way out. And they try to, at first, when they think they might escape, they think, that well, we don't need God. One of them does, but the others don't. And then when it gets 
to the point of absolute desperation, then they demand, you better show yourself, and they blaspheme God, in fact. That's why I don't recommend the movie. It, it, there's blasphemy in it, and I, I, I didn't like that at all. Um, it was wrong. But, you know, for them, God was extraneous, and God didn't answer them. Well, they weren't trying to do God's will in the first place, you know, before they got into this mess. But that's another problem. There is no greater priority than this, to enable the people of our time once more to encounter God, the God who speaks to us and shares his love so that they might have life in abundance. And that comes from John chapter 10, verse 10, where Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. John 10, verse 10, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Everybody else is a thief. That's what he calls them in that verse. Everybody else is a thief. But Jesus came to give life abundantly. Now paragraph three. From Dei Verbum to the Synod on the Word of God. So Dei Verbum is the document that we just finished reading over last week. That's the Vatican II document on Revelation. And he says with that 12th synod of bishops on the word of God back in October 2008, we were conscious of dealing in a certain sense with the very heart of Christian life. In a, you know, th that the Bible is at the very heart of Christian life. It's not a peripheral. It's not something that's extra. It's at the very core of what it means to be a Christian, to have revelation. And the previous synod, the, the seventh synod, had also gone at a core issue when it tackled the Eucharist as the source and summit of the church's life and mission. So the Pope says, indeed, the church is built on the word of God. This is one of the things that we take as a basic act of faith. The church is built on the word of God. She is born from that word. People preaching the word of God help give birth to the church. On the first Pentecost, St. Peter and the apostles were preaching the word of God. They were quoting the Old Testament and making the, the first statements of the New Testament, which were written down in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. So the church was born from the word of God, and the church lives by that word. And the church continues to be nourished by the word. Throughout its history, the people of God has always found strength in the word of God. When you read the fathers of the church, you see how much they comment on Old and New Testament alike. So much of what the fathers wrote were commentaries on sacred scripture. And today, too, the ecclesial community, that, that is the church, grows by hearing the word, celebrating the word, and studying the word. Now, look, look at those three activities. We hear it when we read scripture. We celebrate it when we hear it in the scriptures, in the, in the liturgies, I should say, in the sacraments. And then we study the word by diligent examination of what's, what it means. It must be acknowledged that in recent decades, ecclesial life has grown more sensitive to this thing, that the word of God has become more important over the last few decades than it had been in the previous decades before the Vatican Council. And before the Vatican Council, scripture was not as well read in Catholic circles. But after the council, we became more sensitive to it, particularly with reference to Christian revelation, namely the living tradition of the fathers of the church and the written scriptures. And remember how we talked about that in Dei Verbum, that we, we talked about how important both the oral tradition and the written word are. We need both. 
beginning with the pontificate of Pope Leo XIII, we can say that there was a crescendo of interventions aimed at increased awareness of the importance of the Word of God in the study of the Bible and the life of the church. So Pope Leo XIII wrote a wonderful encyclical, which you can also get at EWTN.com in our documents library under encyclicals. It's called Providentissimus Deus, which is about scripture and scripture study and reading in the church. And in Providentissimus Deus, paragraph 24, it says, Such, venerable brethren, are the admonitions and the instructions, which by the help of God we have thought it well at the present moment to offer you on the, on the study of sacred scripture. It will now be your province to see that what we have said be observed and put into practice with all due reverence and exactness, that so we may prove our gratitude to God for the communication to man of the words of his wisdom. So we should show gratitude to God for giving us scripture and that all the good results so much to be desired may be realized, especially as they affect the training of the students of the church, which is our own great solicitude and the church's hope. Pope Leo XIII was very concerned about training seminarians. And one of the things he wanted them to be sure they learned was sacred scripture. He encouraged them to learn the ancient languages of Greek and Hebrew and to study the scriptures in the original language, or if not, to at least learn it in the, the languages they did understand so they could teach it. And then this crescendo, there are other documents Pope Benedict XV wrote uh, a wonderful uh, encyclical on St. Jerome, on the anniversary of St. Jerome's death. And Pope Pius XII wrote a wonderful encyclical on how to study scripture. But it culminates in the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation, De Verbum at Vatican II. The latter represented a milestone in the church's history. And he quotes from the Synod of Bishops, where he says, the Synod Fathers acknowledge with gratitude the great benefits which Dei Verbum brought to the life of the church. Benefits about exegesis, which is the explanation of scripture. That's what exegesis is, explaining scripture. Theological explanations, spiritual explanations, pastoral and ecumenical explanations of Scripture, going to look at Scripture from a variety of points of view so that we understand more and more of the depths of Scripture. Now, the years from Vatican II until now have also witnessed a growing awareness of the Trinitarian and Salvation historical horizon of Revelation. What does that mean? It means that in the years since Vatican II, we've been looking to understand the Blessed Trinity better in Scripture and also to understand how there is a history of salvation. The history of the people of Israel is a history of salvation. It's not just you know, knowing names, dates, and places for various political reasons, but it is a history of human salvation. And uh, against this, not against it, but you know, in, in light of this, Jesus Christ is to be acknowledged as, quote, the mediator and fullness of all revelation. This is a quote from De Verbum, paragraph 2. Remember, we read this, where it says, by this revelation, then, the deepest truth about God and the salvation of man shines out for our sake in Christ, who is both the mediator and the fullness of all revelation, so that we know about God through Jesus. We know about what it means to be saved through Jesus. Jesus Christ reveals that salvation to us. And to each generation, the church unceasingly proclaims that Christ completed and perfected revelation. This is from De Verbum 4. 
Jesus perfected revelation by fulfilling it through his whole work of making himself present and manifesting himself. Through his words and deeds, his signs and wonders, but especially through his death and glorious resurrection from the dead and final sending of the spirit of truth. This is how Jesus perfected revelation. It's not by philosophy, but by this. And then the final paragraph of section three, everyone is aware of the great impulse which Dave Verbum gave to the revival of interest in the word of God in the life of the church. Dave Verbum, the Vatican II document, inspired people to study the word of God, to reflect on divine revelation, and to study sacred scripture. And there's been a lot more scripture scholarship since the Vatican Council. In the last 40 years, the church's magisterium also issued a number of statements on these questions. Uh, the Pontifical Biblical Commission did things on the interpretation of the Bible in the church. Uh, and, it's, and it mentions how the scriptures, as given to the church, are the communal treasure of the entire body of believers. It is true that the familiarity with the text of Scripture has been more notable among the faithful at some periods of the church's history than in others. But Scripture has, has been at the forefront of all the important moments of renewal in the life of the church, from the monastic movement to the early, of the early centuries to the recent era of the Second Vatican Council. By celebrating this synod, the church is conscious of her continuing journey under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The church is still learning and being guided by the Holy Spirit. And she felt called to reflect further on the theme of God's word. Why? To review the implementation of the, implementation of the council. We want to see are we doing what the council said to do about studying more scripture? That's one of the things we want to check on. And secondly, to confront new challenges uh, from the present time, which approach various Christian believers. We want to deal with these challenges by studying scripture and understanding the word of God and giving greater glory to God. All right. Well, that concludes paragraph three. Let's take a break and we'll come back in just a couple minutes with questions from you about this and other topics. So please stay with us. Thank you and welcome back. Uh, first of all, I'd like to invite you to come and be part of our live studio audience by coming here on pilgrimage. If you have a chance to be here on pilgrimage, please contact our pilgrimage department and let them know you're coming. Uh, you can call them at 205-271-2966. That's 205-271-2966. Or you can go to our website, www.ewtn.com. And they'll give you information about places to stay, um, scheduling for masses, programs, uh, information on how to travel up to the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament in Hansville, and other things that you might need to know. So please come in, uh, and join us. We'd love to have you. Now we have a caller on the line. We have John. Uh, calling in. Hello, John. Hi there. Hi. Where are you from, John? Kentucky. Great. And what is your question? Well, I was raised in a Catholic orphanage. Okay. I, my dad died as a month old, and uh, late of us, and I had to go to the orphanage. And uh -huh. uh, uh, for years, I quit going to church. 
And now I, I quit drinking and been going to the harvest, you know, Church of God. Mm-hmm. And I ask questions, you know, and, and they say things about you have to be, uh, you know, washed in the blood. Right. Well, that, that, that makes me feel like, you know, that I should do more. You know, I, I was baptized and confirmed when I was a kid. Okay. So I know all Catholics uh, are going to be there. That's where if you figure you haven't been baptized, you can't be saved. And uh, I've asked about it, you know, and they said, well, even the, even the preacher, I asked him. He said, well, the Bible says repent and be baptized. Yes, it does. So, so, what, so what's your question exactly? Well, I want to make sure that I'm safe, you know, but I was baptized when I was a kid, and I just wanted to make sure that sure. I was safe, you know, saved. Sure, sure. Well, here's, here's the thing. You know, being baptized is like being born. In John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus talks about being born again of water and the Spirit. And that's what baptism does for us. But when you were born, that wasn't enough, was it? You also had to grow and mature. And that's also true in the faith. Being born again is a start. Just like any birth is a start. But you then have to take the next steps. And eventually you learn to walk, then you learn to run, and you, you learn to do well as a Christian. So this is one of the things that we're talking about with this document. You need to read your Bible and to hear your Bible read. This is one of the reasons why we want you to be coming to Mass, so that you can hear the Word of God. You're, not, you're going to hear so much of Scripture read at Mass on a daily basis, as well as, of course, on Sunday. And to hear the words of God so that you learn how to live out your faith. That is the task at hand. And you need the sacraments. Just like, you know, it's not only getting born again and learning how to walk, but you also have to get fed. And so you need the Eucharist so that you can come and be fed not on natural food, but to be fed on the body and the blood of Christ. You need that daily nourishment. Jesus says you need it because he said in John 6, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot have life within you. So you need to come and receive the body and blood of Christ. And that's going to be another part of what you need to do. And then another aspect, you know, you, you were confirmed, and that strengthens you to be a soldier for Christ. Christ is also going to ask you to serve him in various ways to your ability. And he's going to want you to be his witness because not only did he say, repent and be baptized, but he also said after his resurrection, I will make you my witnesses to the end of the earth. And this is how you are going to be a witness too. So there's a salvation isn't just having one thing. If I just do this one thing and I'll be saved. Jesus calls us to a whole way of life. When he says repent, he means turn around, turn your whole life around and follow me. And that's exactly what you have to do. So, so that's what I'm urging you to do, John. You know, keep on growing in the faith and learn the whole counsel of God and not just, don't worry about just one part, but learn about as much as you can so that you can be faithful to the, the Jesus. All right, we have another call on the line. We have Annie. Hello, Annie. Hello. Hi, where are you from? Springfield, Mass. 
Great. And what is your question? Well, my question is, um, we're Hispanic, Puerto Rican. When we, it's, it's regarding actually blessing. What are the benefits when, you know, a priest gets his blessing to the community or let's say a uh, mother to their children, uncle, aunt, you know, everything. Okay. When we get together at my mom's house on Sundays, um, when everybody, when we're going to leave, all you hear is in Spanish, we just say bendición, which means give me your blessing. And all you hear is everybody bendición, bendición, uncles and aunts. And also, um, what is the benefit um, when a priest, sometimes I'll take my rosary and be blessed by a, you know, a priest. What are the benefits actually to giving your blessing? Okay, very good questions. The blessing that the priest gives to people, for instance, at Mass, at the end of the Mass, he gives a blessing, is a way to communicate various graces that he blesses you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, not in his own name. And by blessing you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, he's bestowing upon you by his ministry as a priest some of the gifts of God's grace upon you. Now, when he blesses an object like a rosary, then he is setting it apart. You know, I've got a rosary in my pocket and I keep it because I say my rosary as I walk, as I drive, and various other times of the day when I sit in the chapel. And I don't wear my rosary around my neck as a decoration. This is a blessed object. It's not a piece of jewelry. And I know some people are wearing the rosary as a piece of jewelry, but that's not what it's meant for. It was by the blessing of the priest, it is set apart for holy purposes. And it is set apart for prayer and devotion. So that's why the priest blesses it. And as we pray with a blessed object, there are extra blessings that come to us from using a blessed object. So that's why we do that. Okay? All right, thank you for calling, Annie. We have Joseph on the line. Hello, Joseph. Hello, Father Mitch. Hi, where are you from? I'm from Brainerd, Minnesota. Great. That's, that's way up there. Uh, what, what's your question? Um, my question is, um, a family member of mine had a question about how Jesus is present to us uh, personally, like individually, okay. Okay. and in ecclesial life in, uh, in the scriptures. Okay. And uh, specifically the Bible, you know, the okay. Word of God. Okay. As opposed to created matter or to the blessed Eucharistic presence. Um, she wanted to know how does that mean? Is Jesus in the Bible? Is he in the words? Is he when they're speaking at Mass? How does that work and what does that mean to us? Okay. Thank you. Good. A very important question. As a matter of fact, we're going to be getting to some of that as we go through this document. But one of the things is that God is present in nature. Okay? And God is present everywhere. And that is very important to have his presence everywhere. And that's one of the reasons I like nature. I love to be outside in the woods. Uh, it's a very beautiful place. And it's not only in the grandeur of the Rocky Mountains, but it's also in the smaller things going on around in the woods. The, the new, right now, we're already starting springtime here in Alabama. And the new growth that's coming up, the, the trees are full of new twigs and uh, the, the tree next door to my house already has blossoms on it. And to be amazed at the beauty of creation helps us to realize how beautiful God is. And that is a, a great thing. But it's also kind of mute. You know, you can look at that and it's, it's a, a mute expression of what God is doing. Whereas when we read the word of God, God speaks to us in those words. And that is a more personal presence. For instance, I can be at a party 
and I can be next to a lot of different people. But when I start to talk to the persons and listen to them, then I can say I start to get to know them. If I just am at a party and they happen to be there, and maybe I met them and got their name and said hello, then they would be a vague acquaintance. And that's the way a lot of nature is with us. But when we read the scripture, God is present in a more personal way. And we find out the mind of God as we listen to scripture, just like I find out the mind of the people I'm with as I learn to listen to them and talk to them. And the scriptures not only tell us what God thinks, but they also give us words. For instance, the book of Psalms is a book of prayers by which God gives us the words to be able to pray to him. And so this is going to be a much more personal kind of encounter. So, so, and then in the Eucharist, Christ is even more personally present where he gives us his very self. He gives us himself to receive into our own selves. And we enter into, a, we call it communion because we are entering into a communion with him. So there are different levels of presence. And we find God in a wide variety of ways. But we sh because we are human persons who have minds and, and hearts as well, we can enter more deeply into personal relationship with God than we can just with nature. Nature is a wonderful gift, but we need a more personal relationship with God than that. And that's what Scripture and the Eucharist help us. Okay? All right. Let me take a look at an email. Dear Father Mitch, recently the religion column in a local newspaper carried an article entitled Dogma, comma, Theology Can Detract from Christ's True Message. Unquote. It was by Jim Atwell, a minister of the Religious Society of Friends, the Quakers. The following passage really threw me, and he quotes, In many Christian churches today, a telling relic of this period is recited each Sunday, the Apostles' Creed. It dates from the 3rd century A.D., and its very content demonstrates how opaque the cocoon has become. For there's a hole in that creed, right in the middle of it. It says, quote, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Wait, wait, that creed just jumped from Christ's birth to his passion. Not a word about his ministry, healings, or his sublime basic commandment to love as he loved us. That's not just a hole, it's a chasm, one showing that the early church's leadership focused, close focus on dogma. Unquote from the article. So, John in upstate New York asks, could you please comment, Father? This statement does not sound right. Well, it's not right. It, it's not a very profound understanding of the creed. The creed is giving a list of very important dogmas that had been called into doubt. People doubted that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. People doubted that he really died. Some people say he didn't really die. And they doubted the resurrection and the other points of the creed. Whereas nobody doubted the public ministry, that was not a source of confusion. So the creed didn't mention anything about the public life of Jesus because it was not a source of a problem. But these other dogmas were sources of problem because some people were denying them. Now, that's one issue. Secondly, what this gentleman which is name again, Mr. Jim Atwell, also fails to understand, is that he does not read what the early fathers of the church wrote. 
they did not just write about dogma. They wrote commentaries on scripture, St. Hippolytus, Origen, um, Justin Martyr, and many others wrote about a wide variety of issues. The creed is one document among thousands. Why would you say that that's the only thing that the church cared about? It cared about all of these documents, all that the fathers of the church wrote. And they did cover all these other issues with commentaries on scripture, books about the spiritual life, and so on. So I would just simply say that Mr. Atwell is very superficial in his understanding of the early church uh, because his church doesn't go back to the early church. We do, and we pay close attention to the fathers, and that's what I would urge you to do as well. All right, uh, we have another call on the line. Hello, Debbie. Hi, Father Pockler. Hi. I want to thank you for everything that you do. You're absolutely a very gifted man. And well, I, thank you. Thank you so much. My absolutely pleasure to do what I can. <laughs> Franklin Square, New York, and I have two questions. One is on the creed also, and I was wondering where it says, Jesus suffered, died, and was buried, and on the third day he rose again. Where did he rise? When, when did he rise first? <laughs> okay. The, see, and, and, and uh, let, the, let me answer that one first, okay. okay? The word resurrection is anastasis, all right? And the, the ana at the beginning of the word in Greek is a, a um, prefix that means again. So the, the very word resurrection means rise again. He had been, he had been walking around. He died and then rose again from the dead in the sense that he, not that he rose, not that there were two resurrections, mm -hmm. but that he had been walking around. He was in the tomb and then he was rising. He rose and walked again. Oh. And that's why they use the word again. Oh, okay. Okay? Plus, in the, it's in the word Anastasis. Okay. All right? Okay. What's your other I, question? Okay. What is the church teaching on life on planets or galaxies? And if there is, are people, whether it's humans, and there was an original sin in that, on that planet or that galaxy, how would God handle that? Would his only begotten son be sent again? And then how would he be... Uh, conceived, and how does that play into... Very, very interesting question. First of all, the church remains agnostic about other people on other planets. We, that means we don't know. And that's a very, that's a very important uh, point. Uh, we wouldn't um, be, uh, we would not know if there are people on other planets. So that's something that we leave as something until we meet them. If we meet them, we'll believe in them. If we don't meet them, we're not going to believe in them. That's simply what it is. Secondly, if we meet people from another planet, we would have to find out from them about themselves. Maybe they never fell into original sin. Maybe they did. Because they're not descendants of Adam and Eve, so they would not inherit our original sin. So they, uh, if they had original sin, it would be on their own planet. And then we'd have to talk to them about salvation. It could be that we would bring them the good news that God became a human being and that they might need to be baptized if, if they have original sin. If they don't have original sin, they might teach us a lot about virtue because that would be a better thing than we have. You know, receiving grace after the fall is not as good as never having to uh, had a fall in the first place. So we'll have to wait and see. We'll meet them. We'll enter into dialogue with them and hope that they're better than we are. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's, uh, I'm afraid I have to call this to a conclusion. Uh, it's been a delight to be with you. I want to give you my blessing going back to the earlier phone call. Almighty God bless you and keep you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And secondly, we just want to remind you that this network is brought to you by you. 
You make it possible with your donations. And so we have been cutting back, and all the workers here know how much they've cut back. But we still need your help to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill so we can pay our bills. Thank you.